Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining the Women's Commission at, on a panel discussion on ways to live a political life. My name is Cheryl Bergman. I'm the Executive Director of the Michigan Women's Commission. And the women's, and I'm joined by four of our commissioners today who are incredible, politically powerful women, and we'll hear from them in a minute. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background about the Women's Commission. The commission was established in, by statute, in uh, state statute, in 1968, with a mission of surveying the women of Michigan, identifying problems that they face, making recommendations to address those problems, and recognize the achievements of women in Michigan. When I began this uh, as executive director late last year, the Governor Whitmer said, let's survey the women of Michigan. So the commission and myself, along with the governor, held conversations around the state with women to find out what their priorities are. And wherever we went from Grand Rapids to Flint, from Traverse City to Detroit, the priorities that the women told us they were most interested in, in achieving gender equity, were, were economic security issues. So our commission currently has formed committees, working groups, to address the issues that they identified. We have our Financial Freedom Committee, which is looking at pay equity and a pathway to higher paying jobs, unlocking opportunity where we're looking at addressing child care affordability and accessibility, as well as paid parental leave and family leave, and our Visible Authentic Leadership Committee, which is uh, addressing the issue of increasing the number of women in leadership positions across the board in Michigan, academia, corporate boards, and nonprofit boards, um, elected uh, officials, and <clears throat> um, I'm going to ask the commissioners this question to start off with, but I will um, introduce myself a little bit more by saying that before I started with the Women's Commission, my passion and was to help elect women in Michigan. So I helped to elect Senator Stabenow as the first woman United States Senator in the state of Michigan. Governor Jennifer Granaholm, who was our first woman governor in the state of Michigan, and most recently helped to elect our current governor, Gretchen Whitmer. Um, I think I'd love to see a whole lot more firsts in the state of Michigan for women. I believe that the Women's Commission is getting down and doing the work that can help us achieve <clears throat> and make Michigan a state of firsts in our fight for gender equity in this state. And I would love to now turn it over to our panelists, ask each of them to introduce themselves and tell us how they're living a political life, either person, personally and or professionally right now, and how living a political life helps us address gaining some more firsts for women in the state of Michigan. Uh, Kelly, you are unmuted, so I'm gonna go to you first. Kelly Saunders. Well, thanks, Cheryl. Um, I was appointed to the Michigan Women's Commission, or started my service, I should say, in January of 2019. Um, but currently, right now, I work at the Edward Lowe Foundation, where we help second stage entrepreneurs grow their business. Prior to that, I worked for 12 years in government, four years at the Department of State, and then eight years in the executive office under former Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly. <clears throat> so um, I've, I've tr transitioned out of public service kind of into the nonprofit world. So this is a, a fun topic for me to talk about, but the more, um, I'd say the, the way I lead a political life currently is I'm the president of the Gerald R. Ford Republican Women's Club in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, our group focuses on 50% philanthropic work, but then 50% political work within local GOP organizations in the second and third congressional districts. Um, when I took over this group a little less than two years ago, they only had 10 members because they had some internal issues, um, but now we're up to 50 members strong. We have definitely done a lot of work within the West Michigan community to help families 
um, on the philanthropic side and have helped a lot of women in West Michigan get elected to local offices. So right now that is my more direct political work um, and I'm really thankful to be here and have this discussion today. Thanks, Kelly. Charity, I see you next. Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I am um, Charity Dean. I was appointed to the Michigan Women's Commission last year by Governor Whitmer. Um, and how am I living a political life? So I serve as the director of our Civil Rights, Inclusion, and Opportunity Department in the city of Detroit. And so my job in and of itself, I'm an appointee of Mayor Duggan. Um, and I've been working for the mayor for about six years in different capacities. Um, so my job is very political. Um, in addition to that, I, you know, uh, when I get free time, I like to help on local elections. Uh, this past, uh, this past election cycle, I worked on um, the school board election. We have, we're supporting three uh, women for uh, school board. And so um, I was able to help with that. Um, and then I think community life is very much ingrained in political life, right? And so I am um, active in my neighborhood association. I'm the president of my neighborhood association, um, Grandma Community Association Board. And so I really, I, I really think it's important because I am someone that when I see kind of problems or issues, I really want change. Um, and I don't like to wait for other people to change things. And so um, being involved in political life means I take responsibility for what's happening um, and I can be responsible for making change where, there's, where, where it's needed. So super happy to be here and excited to talk to you all today. Thanks, Charity. Dr. Geneva. Hi everyone, good evening, good afternoon, and just such a delight to be here uh, with all the panelists and want to say a special shout out to Cheryl who certainly has shown uh, the leadership and what we really need more of in terms of all that wonderful help to elect and get women into leadership positions. Uh, I'm happy to be with you and talk about this subject of uh, political life. I've most of my professional career has been in the nonprofit world. I led the United Way, have worked with foundations, led foundations, and then started a company uh, called Dr. Geneva Speaks, where I thought the most important thing was to work with others, particularly women, to help us all always find our voice. And that's what I think a political life is about. It's about being a leader, finding your voice. Now, my political life has mainly been the appointed route. So I've been appointed to boards and commissions and university boards by um, all the governors since Milligan, all the mayors in Detroit since Coleman Young, and all the Wayne County executives since McNamara. So that has spanned my 40 year career and it has been an incredible opportunity. I'm very blessed because I've met a lot of people who are about creating change. And so when I think about a political life, I think about a platform on which we have the opportunity to create change, to influence others, and to make a better world for our children and families. So I'm really happy to be here today to learn and to share with all of you. Thank you, Geneva. Uh, Mula, who is also um, uh, the chairwoman of the Michigan Women's Commission. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon or evening. Um, so yeah, my name is Muna Jundi, and I am I was appointed by Governor Whitmer to the uh, Women's Commission last year, and earlier this year was um, appointed as the chairperson. Uh, and I think Cheryl purposely had me go last just because she was trying to make me stumble compared to my colleagues. Um, in, in terms of political life, this is actually my first uh, in terms of a political appointment. I have not worked for any administrations. I have not worked for any campaigns. Uh, what I've seen in, like, in, in my world, political life to me has been public service. 
and that has generally been in the nonprofit arena. And I feel like, you know, it's, it's connected. So, you know, a public service, you can be a public servant from within the system, and you can be somebody who's a public servant from outside the system. And I have mainly in my career focused my service outside of the system. And, you know, you can get crazier and rowdier when you're outside the system, pushing the system to do to do what it's supposed to do and to hold it accountable. So, you know, I'm an immigration attorney and I've been a cooperating attorney with the ACLU of Michigan for over a decade. Uh, I'm co-chair of election protection for Genesee County um, Democrats. And I've been involved in um, Syria advocacy, an organization called Americans for Free Syria, and that's a nonprofit. So, you know, in terms of what I think um, political life. I feel like each of us has a role to play, and I love the idea of lifting other women. Um, uh, I, I really do feel, and I just throughout my career, I've seen this that when women get together, we just tend to get more done. Um, and and really, it is, and it's so the lack of fifty percent representation minimally in all arenas is not about in my opinion, it's not about women needing to be at the table. It's about the country, the state, the city, you know, needing us at the table. Because when women get involved, I feel like the outcomes are much different. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. I told you they were all powerful, politically connected women. Um, so next question. Why do you think it's important for women to be politically engaged? And what is one in outcome due to your political activity or efforts that you're most proud of? Um, who would like to start on that one? Charity looks ready. Oh, wow. Is that my look of readiness? <laughs> okay. Um, it's important for women to be uh, politically engaged because, and, and I am very biased as a woman, uh, but we, um, we give birth, right? So um, we are, you know, we, you can find us in every single area, right? There's not a, you know, maybe the representation might need to increase, but um, so from raising sons, to raising daughters, we kind of can get a holistic perspective of things that impact people, human, right? Um, and so you have to be politically involved in order to make change. Um, and, and political involvement varies, right? It could be raising kind children. And I know that sounds, um, it might sound super simplistic, but in the world that we live in today, you know, you know, as a mother, and I'm a mom, so I, you know, I talk about this. I talk te teach my children that, you know, there's one thing to be ambitious, and there, there's one thing to be smart, but there's another level of uh, of uh, grace of just being kind to each other. And what that does, if you are a leader and you practice kindness, I mean, from the from the White House all the way down, the impact that you could make, you could literally save lives. Um, but so, so women have the um, the the privilege. Um, uh, of being able to see that, but but also because things impact us, everything impacts us. Uh, whether you're making decisions about um, infrastructure or whether you're making decisions about education, they impact us and we have unique perspectives. And so those unique perspectives ha have to absolutely um, be represented. And I, I agree 100% with what Muna said about getting things done. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of data that shows that when women are involved in the boardroom, when women are involved in, in when, with policy, um, businesses succeed, the left, the left businesses grow when you've got women that are decision makers. And so uh, that applies in the political space, um, absolutely. And so I, the more women I think we have in politics, the less restrictive sometimes our politics can be and more people focused. It just, it just is. Thank you. Dr. Geneva, do you want to take that question too? Why is it important for women to be politically engaged? And what's something that you're most um, proud of due to your political efforts? You're, you're on mute still. One of Why? my most, how about that? 
Yeah, one of one of my most favorite um, quotes by Mary McCloyd Bethune. She said, "After God, we're indebted most to women. First, for making life possible, and second, for making life worth living." And so I really do believe we have a special uh, blessing, place, and responsibility in this world to take care of our children, our families, ourselves, and the world. So that's why I think it's important for us to be in this process that in fact influences and changes things. I've been with so many, many women on so many efforts and you know, have seen change. The thing that comes to mind in terms of an outcome is when, you know, in this state, there used to be a policy that when children were in homes where they were basically living in poverty, that there wasn't enough food in the refrigerator, their mom didn't have a job, or the place, their home wasn't the cleanest, if the government or social workers came in and saw that, they would immediately remove those children from those homes where it was those conditions only because they were poor and immediately place them in a foster care system. And once placed in that system, it's so hard to get out. Well, a group of primarily women uh, just fought for that. They testified, they advocated, they lobbied, they wrote position papers, all those kinds of things that sometimes we forget are important in the political world, because it's just not about running for elected office. And they testified and they kept telling stories and talking to legislators and that policy was changed. So now what happens when children are found to be in these situations? I'm not talking about abusive situations. I'm just talking about kids whose parents or moms don't have jobs and are living in perhaps not the best of conditions. They won't be snatched out. They'll be put in a safe environment with kinfolk with the main priority to re reunite them with their parents. As women, that's an important issue for us about what happens to our children. And it's one of the things, the many things that um, women that I know um, gathered and worked on to try to make a difference. Thank you, thank you. Kelly, do you wanna address the same question? Sure, um, it's kind of a nice dovetail into what Dr. Geneva was just saying. You know, I think when we think about politics, we kind of think about the ugliness of it <laughs> sometimes. Um, so to me, in leading a political life, it does blend into, but gets to what I really love, which is the governing and the policy making piece. So you have to go through the political process to get leaders elected or put yourself into a position to be able to enact and really have a voice into that policy or work in the, in the business to be able to do so. So I like to kind of separate the two, even though they blend a little bit to say, to go through the political process is important, to get women elected and into the process is important. But when you get to that governing piece, that's where the sweet spot is to be able to really impact and change lives for people who live here in Michigan. And so being a part of that political process to get to that good stuff, it's not always pretty. You can still uphold yourself and have integrity in that process to get to the good stuff. So, um, I just think that that governing piece is so important and finding people who have stances that uh, you can believe in and getting them into those places. If you're not a part of that process, then you're going to have a hard time enacting the policies that you really want um, into whatever sector you're working in. And so um, the one of the things I think I'm the most proud of that I was trying to think of all the policy that I was involved in in the eight years I worked for Lieutenant Governor Kelly, I think the autism insurance reform mandate was probably the most impactful one that I worked on. Um, we had to go up against business and insurance industries to get that implemented because it was, you know, when you make a change to an insurance um, claim, that is, it's hard for business and for insurance companies to swallow. And so to see 
moms come together to get access and treatment for their children and to get reimbursed was amazing. It was tough to hear testimony, but to coordinate and get that coalition going and to make legislate the legislature understand how important this was so that we could put kids and their families on a trajectory to have a more self-determined independent life so parents didn't have to worry about that their kids were going to be taken care of when they get when they grow up it was probably the hardest most rewarding piece that i've ever worked on and so to be a part of that work was a gift and I'm so happy to see Michigan State University have one of the top programs in the country for training applied behavior analysts. And so we also grew the workforce because people wanted to work in this treatment, but couldn't stay here because we didn't have jobs for them. And now we do. So um, being a part of that work was huge. And I'm just so thankful that those moms and those families could see their kids get the support that they needed. Thanks, Kelly. Luna? So I know your question was or is about uh, successes. And I think that my laundry list of failed outcomes is much larger than my list of successes. And in a way, I see that as a success. And I'm not trying to be, you know, um, like super theoretical here. But I feel like the small d democratic process is about you, you know, about me trying to make a change. And that change is never going to be, or very, very, like for me personally, it's not about me. It's about me as one piece of this ecosystem. And so I do my part and others do their part, and then the chips fall where they may. And part of these failures, I feel like, you know, means handling it well. So I feel like, you know, nowadays we're not seeing, you know, the president handling um, a failed attempt at a candidacy very well. Uh, but I feel like that's, that's part of it. Like I was thinking, okay, I was big supporter of Hillary Clinton in 2016, you know, the affirmative action um, proposal. I was very involved and that was like my number one project, lost that miserably, like in the, in the referendum. Um, you know, and I'm just gonna give the example of the Flint water crisis. You know, when people talk about the Flint water crisis, they think about water and lead in the water. And yes, obviously that was a symptom, but it was a crisis of democracy that happened. And we here in Michigan, we organized to get, after we saw the failed emergency manager law that um, Governor Snyder had put into place, uh, you know, we got on the ballot, the, and that was an effort, right? Got on the ballot to um, uh, revoke the emergency manager law and that succeeded. So everybody's like, yay, we succeeded. And then the legislature attached it to the budget bill, which is the one bill in the constitution that you cannot subject to a referendum. So then that locked it into place. Then you had an emergency manager that was appointed to the city of Flint with absolutely no local accountability to the mayor, to the city council. I mean, there's this video of the then mayor, you know, turning it on and drinking the water. Dude didn't know what was going on uh, because he wasn't privy to any of the conversations. And when the information about how this water was high lead and the governor's office knew about it, you know, none of us knew and none of the elected officials knew. So was that a success? Really ultimately it wasn't, uh, but that I feel like that's my job is to keep pushing even when there's um, a failed attempt that, you know, we need small wins. None of us are like, you know, can, can stand being always losers. Uh, but sometimes you don't have big wins, you have small wins. And I know that with the ACLU, you know, we have small wins and then we get our butts kicked in a, on a court case. And, and then that sets bad precedents for, you know, for the future. So um, I just think that, you know, participating in the democratic process um, requires failure, but it requires getting back up and understanding that democracy is a journey. It's not a goal that you get there and you're just, there and you're waving your hand. No, it's a journey and it's something that we have to do in our lifetime. And it's something that I'm trying to teach my daughters who, my daughters are just, you know, 
you know, really big into social justice issues. And yeah, I, you know, I try to explain to them, look, you can't get disillusioned. You're 18 and you're 20. You can't be working on Black Lives Matter. And then, and then, you know, after three, four years, you see that there's no changes. You're like, well, this sucks. I'm just going to sit home. Like, this is a process. It's a lifetime. It's a journey. My goal is to try to leave this world a little bit better for my children and my grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On to our next question. And uh, Dr. Geneva, you touched on this a little bit, but why is it important for women to seek appointments to local boards and commissions? And what has your experience been as an appointee, as a gubernatorial appointee to the Women's Commission and other boards and commissions? What, you know, what, why is that important? Um, Charity, you want to go? Um, I'll say, uh, you know, uh, representation matters um, when you're wanting, if you want equitable results, you've got to make sure that you've got uh, representation and inclusion in your processes. So um, the decisions that are made at, from boards and commissions really can impact. The other thing is, you know, especially being on the commission um, since Governor Whitmer, one of the things that I've really enjoyed is really being a part of crafting strategy, right? So the things that we've been doing um, on this Michigan Women's Commission has really been literally talking to Michiganders who are women, getting their input and then taking it back and sending it to the governor. That's really amazing. Um, and I look forward to seeing, you know, even the next year's state of the city, what, what she's going to say uh, based on this year's work. You know, one of our first projects was having gender equity conversations and I was happy to host one in, in the city of Detroit. We had such a diverse group of women there really talking about what their issues were. Um, and we did those around the state and really synthesized that. Um, and, you know, then, you know, we did one around childcare and um, just being able to hear real issues and then being able to send them to the governor to help craft pol policy is, is an amazing thing. Um, and that's why that representation matters. I sit on a number of other boards. So I sit on uh, the Downtown Development Authority and my role there is really looking at uh, projects that are happening downtown. And there are not a lot of women on that board, but um, being a woman on that board means that I get to have a seat and help make decisions about what's happening in the city that I love. So uh, being on boards and commissions allow you to uh, represent um, a voice that frankly, just for so long in our, um, in our state and in our country has been ignored. We got a long way to go before we get to where we really have true representation. Um, and, and especially for, for women of color, um, Black women specifically, um, for me, it's, it's something that's a passion of mine to, to make spaces for that. Um, and so, uh, but, but participating in boards and commissions really allows me um, to bring value to a conversation and really to, to have a, a unique perspective and to, to bring a different perspective to, to that decision making. And frankly, the other thing is that when women participate, we can make room for other women, right? We never wanna go somewhere and then be the last woman. I never wanna be the last woman to do anything. Um, I always wanna be bringing 10 people behind me, um, so. Thank you, love that. Dr. Geneva? Yeah, I, I love this. Uh... A conversation about you know public service the elected route or the appointed route and I think both are very viable and both uh, give us opportunities as women now on the appointed route you know which as I shared before is the route that I've that I do my political thing in um, Sometimes it's often easier to get that. There are hundreds and hundreds of boards, commissions, things that you can be appointed to. Um, and secondly, you know, oftentimes it's cheaper. <laughs> you know, you run for a political office today, it costs money. <laughs> and so, um, so, so those are some things to, you know, think about. Uh, the appointed, so on, I'm on the Michigan Women's Commission. I chair the a visible authentic leadership committee bow and that's a you know terrific opportunity and what what i think happens when you're on these boards and commissions it gives you again another opportunity 
to use your voice, to express your point of view, uh, to impact policy. But I also think it gives you the opportunity to exert those other very important leadership skills like problem solving, listening, collaboration. And I think those are the skills that um, really are important for us as women to master um, because I think that puts us in a much more influential position. Uh, and, and, you, and you know, that appointed route um, allows you to do that. So many times, you know, we don't think about the appointments because oftentimes when you're appointed to these various things, you are a public figure, you are a public official. So in becoming a commissioner, um, not only did I have to have a security check and a background check, but it was ratified, I believe, Cheryl, by the Senate. And many of these uh, appointed positions do put you, you are a public official. So you're still subject to sunshine laws and your meetings are public and what you say to other people, in fact, can be quoted and put in the newspaper. So you have that kind of public official, because you are, you know, I, we even have business cards as members of the commission. And so, you know, so think about this, I, I think the appointed, you know, these two routes, the elected, which is very, very important. We want to put more, have more women in elected positions, but the appointed process and the appointed route is very um, intriguing and very possible and is quite more accessible. And oftentimes, there's one other thing, Cheryl, I'd like to say about the appointed route, is often you can volunteer for it. I mean, you can raise your hand and say to your legislator or drop a note to the governor or to your elected representative and say, I would like to be a part of, because you know what? Oftentimes for these positions, they're looking for good people. And so that route uh, of appointed route, I think, is a great one. Thank you. Kelly. Yeah, I'm just going to keep dovetailing off of what G Dr. Geneva says. <laughs> I think uh, the point about appoint being appointed is really important. A lot of people, I think, would say, well, how do I do that? They, they don't really know the process. So... There's a lot of appointed positions, obviously, at the state level, if you go to the governor's appointments page, you can uh, view all of the appointments that are available and find something you might be interested in. It is, you know, it's an extensive process to go through, but you just say who you are and say why you're passionate about that and they'll review the you know your application but there's so many things at your local level through your county through your city through your township that you can apply for and they are looking for people to fill those positions but we just don't talk about it enough so I'd encourage you, whether you're looking to get involved at the local level, at the state level, those resources are there. Go to your township or your county um, web pages and type it in and you'll see a laundry list of things that you could get involved in. And so I really think it's more important now than ever that women do get involved in those types of positions because specifically going through the pandemic right now, women are at a crossroads a little bit when it comes to having to choose choose between working and leaving the workforce to go home and take care of their children. And we really should not have to have women sacrifice their careers because they feel like they're, they need to be home. There should be a place for women to do both. And so, you know, whether you are employed, not employed, elected, or whatever, if you don't think that there's a place for you, throw that narrative out because there is somebody who's looking for someone to volunteer and step up and do this work. You're going to be a breath of fresh air. A lot of people don't want to do the work. Um, and if you commit to it and you're interested in it, people are going to really latch on to that. And your story is probably just like somebody else's story. So don't be afraid to share your experiences and really put yourself out there because you may get some no's, but it takes some no's to get to a yes. Going back to what Muna said about you have to fail sometimes to get to the, to the wins. And so my experiences is I had to experience a lot of no's before I got to a yes. 
Um, and my experience on the Women's Commission has been awesome. Um, it's no secret I was appointed by a Republican governor, but I serve a Democrat governor and I'm honored by both. I don't think that there, it, it has to be a choice. Bipartisanship on this commission is above and beyond the best thing ever. And we have such a cordial, unified and determined attitude when it comes to making Michigan a place for women to succeed. And so I feel honored to be appointed by a Republican governor serving under a Democrat governor and with these awesome ladies who um, are, are phenomenal. So I would say, don't let partisanship get in the way. Don't think that you don't have a story or a voice to tell and really seek those positions out because there will be people that take you up on it. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Muna? So my sister and I were just talking actually today. My sister was like, did you see this email? You know, with all of the um, new appointments uh, the gut for, from the governor's office for the commissions. And, um, and so we're like literally making a list of people that we're going to send it to and tell them, look, look into this and, and to apply. And I think a lot of it sometimes is just women don't know about um, these commission, people don't know about these commissions and what they do and what's the added value, what's the time commitment. So I think part of it is us as women encouraging other women to um, apply for these uh, commission seats and there's uh, an opportunity for us to also recommend women to these um, to these commissions. So I do think that that's uh, that's very important. You know, I I also want to say that sometimes, and it depends. I mean, obviously, this is not the issue for me with the women's commission, but I have found that often that when you're on a commission that is an industry that is um, necessarily male dominated that it ends up being a little bit more difficult to have your voice heard. You have to, like I always tell women that, look, if you're, I don't know, particularly in STEM areas and, and business, and you know, I know in the commission we talk about boards, corporate boards, you know, um, you might have to be a little bit of a fighter. And I don't mean it in a bad way, but I mean that you can't expect that the space is going to be made for you you might have a seat, uh, but that seat might have a bubble around it. So, you know, you, you, you can't assume that that space is there for you. You have to sort of make that space. But I, I feel that as women, we have to do that in order to normalize this, like norm, in order to normalize women being in every industry on all these, you know, commission boards, um, regardless of what the, the policy issue is, uh, um, and that that should be normalized. And so somebody has to be the first. Luckily, you know, I'm not a first, uh, but even if you're not the first, the second, the you know, you might be the 10th and the 10th is still, you know, somebody that has to struggle a little bit to make sure that women, a woman, women's voices are heard. And so I just feel like, you know, telling women that, you know, when I have these conversations that look, it's not just about you, it's about you and opening the door for other women uh, behind you. Thank you for that. Um, moving on to the next question, which have you ever supported political candidates, been a political candidate yourself or recruited someone to run? And what was your experience with that? Kelly, you want to start? I'll mix it up this time. All right. <laughs> um, yes, I've definitely supported political candidates. Uh, I have never been a political candidate and it will never happen. <laughs> and um, have I recruited people? Yes. Um, I would say, you know, in three different tokens, uh, supporting political candidates that um, you think would best represent you is paramount to having good representation. So um, I, I'm always a big proponent for researching those people, making sure that they align with what you want to see within your communities um, and at the state level and at the federal level. 
Um, so it's important to be engaged and to know who's running to represent you because I think we, and, and also to educate the people around you about who they are, or if they have questions to be able to get people to be knowledgeable about the process. Personally, I've never wanted to run for office. I really love, um, I loved being a staff member for an elected leader. Um, I think that's really where the meat and the policy making happens. And so I'm a little bit of a, a nerd when it comes to that, just really diving in and being a part of that policy work. Um, and I will say um, people who run for office, more power to them. It is a very hard thing to do. You put yourself out there and your life is now in the public and people will lie about you and they will tell the truth too. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a hard thing to put yourself and sometimes your family through. So it's, it's gotta be, in my opinion, a, a family decision because it's a lot. Um, and working for two people that served statewide, it, it can be inundating. So, um, you know, I'm just not interested in putting myself out that way, but I do love the work that comes with working for elected officials. Um, and then uh, recruited, I think it's um, really important to encourage people in your life, specifically women to run for office, uh, specifically at the grassroots level. So those local offices, a lot of people are afraid um, to do it, which I can understand based on my previous comments, but um, some people just really have the talent for it and the drive and the, the knowledge to be able to do it and having people run for local office to gain experience, um, I think is has really proven helpful for the people that I've recruited and is they've gone on to do great things, but they also are still tapped into those local communities, which we can often see people kind of lose their way as they, they climb higher. You always want to remember where you come from and, and those local roots. And so you build a great bench um, of confidants to be able to advise you, uh, but you also have somewhere to, to go back to and keep you grounded, so. Thank you for that. Uh, Muna, have you ever run for office? No, I haven't even run for the PTO. Do you want so, to make an announcement? <laughs> for PTO? Um, I, I'm too thin skinned for that. Uh, so, you know, like, like Kelly said, that you're really putting yourself out there. Um, it's, ne it's just, I have not run for office. I've never considered um, running for office. And, um, but in terms of supporting candidates. So I feel like, yes, I've done that multiple times and I've supported candidates, whether it's through door to door, like just knocking. I mean, I remember in high school for Bill Clinton, um, knocking door to door, um, you know, whether it's talking to my friends and family about a candidate I wanna support uh, because I believe that they, they align with me or I align with them. Um, in their um, in their stances, and then when it when it comes to political contributions, I feel like sometimes that's the only way that you get access to an elected official in a sort of bigger way. So I do host um, um, those that are running for office, whether it was Debbie Stabenow, Gary Peters, uh, Congressman Kildee, Governor Whitmer, and for the most part on a local level, it's been to introduce our senators and our local member of Congress and our governor to Muslims in the uh, Genesee County area. Oftentimes when people think of the Muslim community in Michigan, they're focused on Southeast Michigan and uh, Dearborn in particular, but we have a very, uh, we, have a, we have a significant community here. So sometimes it's just to meet the community. Um, so I, you know, and it's obviously a candidate that um, I support, uh, you know, for office anyways, and then wanting them using that as an opportunity to introduce. But when it comes to advocacy, uh, you know, and I know that that's a question down the line, Cheryl, but, you know, in, you know, the advocacy work that I've done for Syria, although it's foreign policy, you know, foreign policy necessitates a local flavor, right? So who's making that foreign policy? It's members of Congress it's um, senators, and if you look, 60% of those who go to Congress start at, in their state legislatures. So they're representatives or you know, state reps or state senators. So 
familiarizing your local representatives um, on an issue that matters. Um, I, I've uh, obviously done that, and that has included bipartisanship. So, you know, that hasn't been, though, in my sort of personal, you know, I'm, I'm a Democrat, and so I, you know, vote Democrat and generally support Democratic candidates, but those candidates that, um, or those uh, political, those office holders who are uh, good or receptive to, uh, you know, our issues when it came to Syria, you know, I was willing to engage them. And sometimes that also meant political contribution. Thank you, Charity. Hello, so um, I um, have not been a candidate for political office. Um, I work for a, um, so my boss is Mayor Duggan and I've worked um, or helped with his campaigns and um, I've helped with a number of my friends, local campaigns. So um, friend, state senator campaigns, state rep campaigns, and I've also hosted fundraisers. Um, for folks that I um, believe in and absolutely have given to uh, to help support uh, people in in political office. I think I um, have also also recruiting people for for um, political office, but also really paying attention to those um, races that may not seem like super sexy, uh, but sometimes they can have really, really huge impact when you think about your local clerk's office or your register of deeds um and so one of the things that i like to do is just talk to folks about like all of the things that end up on the ballot and how they all play such major roles and sometimes it's not until a crisis happens that we say oh my gosh this person's been in office for all this time and this is this person right um that we don't really pay attention to some of those races and i know especially when it comes to um like prosecutors races um and uh you know when, when we're talking about racial equity and, and criminal justice reform so um I, I just lift that up to say that you know as we're talking about exploring political office that there's so many other really important uh races that may not uh that we may not talk about because we're already talking about a uh, state rep or state senator but there's so many other races at the county level and at the local level that have huge huge impacts and so um, it's really important for women and of course I'm going to always plug for women of color to, to fill those positions. Thank you Charity. Dr. Geneva. Yes, uh, not since my uh, college days in the 70s when I ran for student government and uh, lost uh, <laughs> and won office and then won another. Uh, no, I have, have not been a candidate and don't have any plans yet, but who knows? And that's one of the things that I think is so um, exciting about the opportunity to be involved in the political life, again, small p, whether it's elected or appointed, because you do have the choice to run. Um, I have supported lots of candidates, worked on loads of campaigns, and in working on those campaigns, I kind of like being behind the scenes on on those elected campaigns sort of the queen maker type role um and uh i think the um opportunity to advise on policy decisions and really talk uh with candidates about their public persona and values and how to communicate and articulate their visions I've uh, mentored a number of uh, young women who I've encouraged to run for um, political office and who've been successful. And I just think it, again, is another way that we can be involved as women in influencing. So whether we're actually ourselves uh, running for an elected office or whether we're behind the scenes or whether we're helping others make policy and change, you know, there's so many ways for us to be involved. Absolutely, thank you. So the next question is um, about your experience with lobbying or advocacy work, um, which is another way that we lead political <laughs> lives. Um, Luna, do you wanna start? 
Sure. You know, I tell you the one thing that I love about advocacy is it forces you out of your comfort zone. Um, you know, I, don't, I can't speak for other people, but for me, I think mo human nature generally, we choose to surround ourselves with like-minded people. So that's our friends, that's our social circles. Um, you know, obviously family, you don't get to choose, so you might get stuck with something you don't like. But when it comes to our, our friends and, and, and um, you know, our, our, we, how we choose to socialize, it often is echo, cha echo chamber. And really, if you wanna advocate for your cause, you're, you're really not gonna get very far without bipartisan support. I mean, generally on any issue, whether it's on a local level, state level, federal level, if there isn't bipartisan support, then you're not gonna really be able to move the needle. So that forces you, and that forced me, to get out of my comfort zone, but it also forces the other side to sit and meet with you. So for example, on the issue of Syria, you know, um, you know, a lot of Tea Party members have been very Islamophobic, very negative um, rhetoric, public about um, Muslims. But when I was working on Syria, and again, it's in a volunteer capacity as a board member, um, but, you know, we would go in when, you know, when there was a reason to, there's a hearing that was going to happen, whatever, and go and request meetings. Our government relations director would request meetings for us with people, with the representatives who uh, were either the, you know, leader or the, the chairperson or the ranking member of the committee, right? So you need to meet with both of them. So by necessity, it's going to be somebody from a, political party that you don't necessarily um, affiliate yourself with. So I found myself going into meetings with members of the Tea Party um, and, you know, others. I mean, that just, you know, I'm not saying that was exclusive, but I, I really felt like it bridges a divide in the sense that really there was never a time that we were going to sit together and have a conversation. I mean, there's never a time in my life that I was going to sit down and have that there's a never a time in my life that that representative was going to invite me or anybody that looks like me to have that conversation. And I'm not saying that it's now rainbows and butterflies because of it. Like I'm not naive about that. But that some, but even if we don't align on 90% of the issues, maybe we can find 10% alignment. And 10% is better than zero. So I just, I feel like in, in terms of the, my, um, involvement in advocacy, that to me has been the lesson that I've learned over this past decade um, and that I've really found valuable, even though, not speaking of failures, you know, even though we have not been able to move the needle on, the, on, on you know, um, stopping Bashar al-Assad from killing the Syrian people, even though we've been working on this for 10 years, I still feel like this was, this in my mind is a win, small w win. Thank you. Uh, Kelly? Sure. Well, I'm not a professional lobbyist. So <laughs> uh, my time in the executive office um, definitely did a lot of advocacy work on numerous topics. And I agree with Muna. Advocacy work makes you dive deep into a subject and really know your stuff. And I think the most interesting part when you're working on advocacy, regardless of what the policy is, um, you could have numerous advocacy efforts going on at the same time and building those coalitions and the stakeholders that you have, you can be on one side with a specific group one day and on another topic, the complete opposite the next. And so I think that it, it really broadens you and is a growth tool um, and you should do it because it does make you uncomfortable. It, it does make you know your stuff. It challenges you, but it also offers you a different perspective from people. And you really do get to know kind of the ins and outs of different personalities. I'm more speaking to Lansing um, because that's where my experience is. Um, but 
you will be able to find some sort of common ground if you go in with an open mind and people will appreciate that as long as you're sincere and i've had a lot more advocacy losses than i have wins that's for sure but i think uh getting back to what moon has been saying the whole time is that you learn a lot more from your losses than you do from your wins for sure and it makes your wins a little bit sweeter but i think also when you're doing that advocacy work and you do have one thing that you work on with someone in, in regardless of whether it's successful or not and you are on the opposite side of them on another subject if you were sincere and you listen to them they will have more respect for you on the other subject and give you a little bit of grace to not maybe hammer you so hard but come to a mutual agreement that you can agree to disagree and not burn those bridges, but continue to work on other things together in the future. So I call it kind of like the art of peacemaking and peacekeeping, dependent on what you're working on and who you're working with. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a skill that everyone should acquire because I think it applies to any sort of thing in life. Uh, advocacy work is hard and um it, it will it will grow you in ways that you have never grown before mainly because of, of personalities but getting to really know the process is important mm -hmm. thank you kelly yeah Dr. yeah i i absolutely agree with Ke what kelly and mona both said i think advocacy uh really helps sharpen your um leadership skills uh, and, and it's interesting because, frankly, as, as, as women, I, I just think we're natural advocates because we find ourselves, I believe, all the time advocating, you know, if it's not advocating our children or for our families. I mean, you know, how many times have we talked to teachers <laughs> about our children? You know, what we do when, the gro or say in the, when we go to the grocery store, we're, we're offended by something that happens or we speak up for a neighbor or a friend or a sister. So, um, so advocacy, that is, that speaking up for something we believe in or something we think is important. I think we do frequently. Um, I think being intentional about it in, in terms of how it might lead us in a political path is what we're talking about here. So, so I, I think the, when we advocate um, in, the, in the political realm, uh, we can, you know, we find out a lot about ourselves. That is our core values and what we think are important. I think we can and do sharpen our collaboration skills because in order to get our point across, we got to hear somebody else's point. There's just no way. It, it really doesn't work being one-sided. <laughs> and um, I think we, when we advocate, we learn how to sharpen our problem-solving skills um, so that we really, you know, identify the right problem. We think about alternatives. Um, we kind of check it out and monitor it. And so those kinds of problem solving processes we, we use when we advocate. But again, so many of those skills I think we do in our everyday life as women. It's just a matter, I believe, about being, you know, if we're interested in a political life, in getting more involved in that, that is being intentional and realize the skills and the capacities we already have and hone them and sharpen them uh, in terms of stepping into that world. But I think the advocacy is so important and it helps, I think, us uh, in particular use and find our voice because voice is, you know, so critical speaking up and us doing that uh, helps us communicate the vision and what we need to do to make change. Thank you, thank you. Charity? Charity, do you have anything to talk about on uh, advocacy and lobbying? Sorry, I got frozen up here. Uh, Nothing more than what my colleagues have already said. I mean, I think one of the just key pieces is that we advocate in ways that we don't always um, realize that we're doing. Um, and I think the, the key is is finding something you're super passionate about, something that impacts you. Um, and it, 
doing it on a local level and being able to see real impact happen very quickly can really inspire you to do it um, at a much bigger and broader level. Um, so, so that's what I'll add. Okay. Final question of the evening is what is one piece of advice you can give to someone who is interested in leading a political life? You just have one piece of advice. Um, Dr. Geneva. Oh, there's so much. Well, I, I would say make a plan. Um, and, you know, kind of really think about it. Um, but, you know, you, I, I don't think it's something you, sh you could, should just jump into, but really make a plan, do some research, find out what, you know, really turns you on, you might be really interested in, um, figure out who's connected, you know, who can you connect with, what kinds of relationships you already have in place, um, do some networking, you know, the networking is always good, but, but what's most important is reach out and connect with those folks who you think might be able to connect you to where your plan wants you to go. Um, you know, put some goals and, and timetables, make a plan. And so by making the plan, I, I, why I think that's important is uh, because uh, it, it helps you be intentional and allows you to be strategic because you're really going to think it through. And then, you know, the thing about making a plan, Cheryl, is make it happen, I believe. So I don't think it's just about thinking about it and researching about it and thinking about the connections and writing it down or whatever have you. Write it down, writing it down, but also activating it, making it happen, execute it. So I think making a plan, I would just put a PS on it, have fun you know, find joy in it. Um, because at the end of the day, um, I believe what's important is that we're making a difference. We're making a difference for others, for our families, for our children, for the world, but we're also making a difference for ourselves. And in doing that, I think it's so important to have fun and find joy. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Kelly, what's your one piece of advice? Yeah, it, like Dr. Neva said, it's kind of hard to pick one, but I kind of have three prongs in my life that I, I look to just, um, you know, the world is run by those who show up. So just show up. Wherever you're interested, whatever you're interested in, that's half the battle of just showing up to that venue and saying, I'm here and activating yourself in some sort of way. So um, commit yourself to showing up. Um, and then the second thing, like I said before, was to seek to understand rather than be understood because relationships matter. And so if you're a person who really seeks to understand and gives per, uh, the people that you interact with um, some leverage to share with you, the, that relationship will go farther than you can ever imagine. It's going to allow you to work on things uh, moving forward, whether you agree or don't agree. And so just giving people the space to share with you really does create relationships that can last a really long time, whether you are on the same side of the aisle or not. Um, and the last thing is don't allow yourself to get siloed. I think we often put ourselves and people in political parties and you're allowed to free individual thought. That's why we live in America. So you don't have to always believe everything in one party platform. You can root yourself in the basic ideals. But um, I think that just speaking from my experience that if you share with people that you're open, you give yourself more credibility and more access and people will come to you more freely because you're an individual. And so I would say don't lose yourself in the noise. Make sure that you stand for what you stand for and you can lend your time and talents to political parties and lead that political life, but be true to yourself because at the end of the day, you have yourself. Thank you. Uh, Charity? You're yeah, my, my advice um, for someone that wants to get into political life is to find out what makes you angry. There's something that really 
burns you up, right? Maybe it's the way you see people being treated, children, um, whatever it is, find out what makes you, you angry and then fix it through politics. Great. Uh, Muna? Uh, I actually just quickly piggyback back off of Kelly. Um, you know, in terms of getting involved in political life, I would say show up like Kelly um, had said. And, and then I would also say do the work. You'd be amazed at the, the combination of those two. Uh, a lot of people, you know, want to see, but then they don't do the work or want to do the work. And so if you are ready and willing and able to do the work, you really can end up very quickly in um, a leadership, whether formal or informal, um, in a leadership role. Can I add one more thing on to that? I'm gonna speak for another one of our commissioners that isn't here tonight, but Commissioner Whitney Gravel, who's also on uh, the Women's Commission, on our last commission meeting said, don't forget to lift as you climb. And that really hit me that, you know, I've had so many people in my life that have been climbing and reached back to grab me and take me along. And so whatever you're doing in life, whatever station, if you're at the very beginning of your political life or your midway, I think we should all be cognizant that we should be reaching back and, and lifting up because we're only going to be as successful as taking that action. So I'm just going to speak on behalf of Whitney because it's too good of a pearl of wisdom to not share with everyone. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. So that was my last question for everyone. And so if there's anyone who is participating who has a question, someone just said yes to that in the chat. If anyone has a question, if they want to raise their hand or throw it in the chat, any of our commissioners would be happy to answer that. Or if any, any of you have uh, commissioners, you have anything else to add, particularly around, um, you know, one question I didn't ask is, is how do you think, what makes it, what would be uh, different or why do we need parity in leadership? Why is it important that we have more women leaders across the board? And that's a question I didn't, um, what do we bring to the table as women that is, that should be there at least in parity to our population, which is 50%, maybe just over 50%. Well, you know, I would just say that one of the things we bring is experience. I mean, you know, there aren't many women that you run across or that you know who haven't experienced a whole lot of something, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, trials, tribulations, failures, um, you know, all of that, you know, as Mona talked about, you know, it's so important to have those things, you know, because they are mixed in with life. And so I think women, because we are, we have so many roles, you know, we can be caregivers and moms and sisters and friends and career workers. And I mean, you know, we have so many roles that because we have so many roles, we have so many experiences. And I think those varying experiences give us um, a, a level of empathy, uh, an ability to understand and see, and it gives us a perspective that I think is important in, in a room. Not the only perspective, but certainly is important in the room, and you notice it when it's absent. Absolutely. Well, Anybody I else? would say, uh, I would say no taxation without representation, Boston Tea Party folks. Half the population. Amen. I mean, it can't come on. We're participating in everything else. You know, uh, we need our representation. So I, I feel like that is, um, is paramount. Oh, I also think one more thing. I also think that I'm a believer in group work. And I really do, you know, though as a mom, I like to just tell my kids what to do. 
Um, I do believe that when you're in a group, you actually come to a better decision, though it takes longer. And I recognize that when you're working in a group, it takes longer to, to figure out what you're going to do. And if your idea is a good, is a good idea, and you're able to sell it to everybody else, you know, at the end of it, you might be like, oh, that was what I wanted to do from the beginning, but that's irrelevant. You went through the process of getting sort of group th think, and overwhelmingly, actually, what happens is that you end up modifying what you think is the right way to handle it, because having other people with different perspectives is always helpful. And the idea that you have men in a room making decisions, separate from the fact that it obviously impacts us, uh, but making decisions without, you know, having 50% of the population just means you're not getting to the right group decision. The more people that are impacted, that are represented, I really do believe you get better outcome. Anybody else want to chime in? We have a few minutes left. I'm not seeing any questions from the participants. Unless I'm missing something. And so I will ask the commissioners if you have any last thoughts. And if not, I think we're going to wrap it up a few minutes early this evening. I just I want to thank Stephanie and MSU Jensen for inviting us and letting us participate in this important conference. And uh, thank you. Yeah, and thank I, you to this, commissioners for participating. Appreciate it. Absolutely. The commissioners were phenomenal. Thank you. And Cheryl, you were phenomenal. Thank you.